So a little bit of her, about her background. So Mallory did her Bachelor's of Science at the University of North Florida. She then did her Master's at San Diego State University with Kevin Hobble, studying structural complexity, seascape patchiness, and body size as factors that influence habitat value for fish. She then uh, moved to the East Coast and did her PhD at Northeastern University in Boston, studying stability of spatially coupled food webs across different scales. And she's also conducted work on oyster and eelgrass restoration. She's worked as an environmental scientist studying water quality in Florida and conducted coral reef research in the Bahamas. So lots of diverse experiences, pretty awesome. All right, and then Mallory, currently she's a postdoc with, at UC Santa Cruz, working with uh, Dr. Pete Ramundi and Dr. Mark Carr and Dr. Will White at Oregon State University. She's broadly interested in how spatial processes interact with local factors to shape both population and community dynamics. I saw on her CV, she is also co-lead of the Santa Cruz R users group. So reach out to her if you want some help <laughs> coding in R and some programming help. So she'd be a great resource for that. Right, and for her seminar here, so Mallory's gonna share some of the work that she did at first in her master's and, and her doctorate, looking at how factors like local landscape features and functional diversity influence trophic interactions and stability of fish communities. So then present some ongoing findings for what she's doing for a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz using demographic population models parameterized with the ROMS regional ocean model system and fish survey data to assess connectivity of kelp forest fisheries across the California MPA network. So with that, Mallory, take it away. <laughs> I also want to preface that I did not have time to add functional diversity stuff into my talk because it the spatial processes thread didn't really encompass that, but I'm happy to talk about fish functional diversity work um, after, if people are interested. Okay, so like Scott alluded, my academic history, um, and the big, like I said, the common thread that goes across all three or is a commonality between all three stories is thinking about spatial processes and how those influence both um, population and community di dynamics of coastal fisheries or fish species. Um, and so we're in one feature I think we can think about across all three of these stories is that the spatial scale really differs dependent on what what story we're talking about. So within my master's work at San Diego State, I looked at really fine spatial scales within one habitat. Um, in my PhD, one of my chapters was really looking at the combination of local and regional factors and how that can influence stability. Um, and then in my postdoc, this work I'm doing now, I'm looking at larger landscape or regional scales, thinking about dispersal across MPA networks. But first, we're gonna start small. And I also am, ha am proud to have got my master's at the CSU institution and happy to be here and talking with you all today. And it seems like you guys are in such a cool place. Um, I'm pretty jealous. Okay, so here we go. can often be characterized for many marine species um, based on utilizing mul multiple habitats throughout their ontogeny. And specifically, juveniles will often use these nearshore, highly structured habitats, um, what we call nursery grounds, before moving offshore to adult habitats. And it's hypothesized that these nursery grounds confer a greater fitness for juveniles because they provide structure to allow the juvenile to seek refuge while simultaneously foraging and getting big before moving offshore. Um, so understanding why and when a species utilizes multiple habitats through its lifespan is really key to understanding how optimality of that fish changes through ontogeny, or organism, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so habitat value for a given species can be predicted using these optimality models or optimality ratio, um, where we measure the habitat quality that a species occupies based on its predation risk and its growth potential, denoted by mu and g. And we wanna minimize this ratio, so decreasing predation risk while increasing growth. And Werner and Hall's classic study of bluegill sunfish in lakes is a really great example, um, showing where sunfish, sorry, um, juvenile sunfish, although uh, food availability is highest in these open water areas, they also experience higher predation risk. 
so the, the, little, the little baby sunfish will often be found in the littoral high vegetated areas because we're minimizing predation risk. However, as a juvenile grows and becomes gape limited from these bass predators, they will actually shift and this new open water habitat becomes most optimal because predation risk decreases and the growth potential is higher. Um, and these, oh yeah, sorry. Importantly, these models really predict what we, the, the observations that we see a species in nature are predicted via these um, ratios. However, oftentimes when we think about the value of a habitat, we just put one value for a whole habitat, but we know that there's a lot of structural variation within a habitat. Sorry, I'm just gonna say habitat a lot in this section, <laughs> sorry. Um, at small scales, variation in structural complexity may be really important in mediating the value of a given habitat in terms of um, seeking refuge while foraging. And for example, small interstitial spaces or the, the space between structure um, may provide important refuge for small individuals, but once those individuals get to a certain size, it may actually inhibit foraging abilities. So you just imagine like a bull in a china shop kind of situation. Um, and within nursery habitats like seagrass beds, substantial variation in structural complexity or shoot density can exist. So this is an example of a habitat map in San Diego Bay where the darker green colors indicate higher shoot density. And we can see that there's variability at really small spatial scales within the amount of shoot density that exists. Additionally, one of the more common juvenile fish that inhabit eelgrass beds in San Diego is surprisingly the giant kelp fish. Um, and although we see them, you know, you can see them in kelp and you'll see them as adults in like the canopy of Macrocystis, but they are everywhere in San Diego eelgrass beds. Um, and actually, when you look at the size range of a kelp fish as it's inhibit, inhabiting an eelgrass bed, it actually has a five-fold increase in body size, even though they're still all juveniles. It goes from when they settle out as recruits, they're about 50 millimeters, and they go all the way to maybe 130 millimeters before you don't see them anymore. So we're assuming they're leaving the seagrass bed. So together, this large range of habitat variation and body size variation make this a great model system to try to understand um, how the importance of habitat structure throughout um, uh, the, the ontogeny or seagrass residency of a juvenile kelpfish. So specifically, we can hypothesize that the optimal structural complexity for a kelpfish will change with body size. So we might imagine that at a smaller body size, predation risk would, would be decreased or minimized in high structural complexity relative to low structural complexity because they have more ability to, refu to, to take refuge. However, due to their small body size, there might not be much variation in their foraging efficiency. They might be able to like seamlessly swim through interstitial spaces better than a larger kelpfish might. So we could, we could hypothesize that high structural complexity might be most optimal because we're minimizing that ratio. Um, conversely, for a large kelpfish, they might be so large that they may have be, you know, um, so big that gape limited predators might not actually be able to consume them. So they're like in a size refuge. So um, for predation risk, structural complexity may not matter, and it might be low for both. However, with higher structural complexity, we've done this past study, past behavioral work in Kevin's lab, have looked at the foraging abilities of kelpfish in, in different structural complexities and found that they do in fact need a, a happy place for foraging um, in that higher complexities can potentially inhibit foraging abilities for these guys, making low structural complexity the most optimal habitat. And so this gets to the overall objective for my master's work, which is to determine whether organismal body size is a key factor mediating the effects of structural complexity on habitat value for a mesopredator. And so we're gonna ask three, or go through three main kind of experiments. So first we're gonna just ask like, where do these fish hang out? You know, like in nature, how are we observing them? So we're gonna do that through a structural habitat selection experiment. We're then gonna look at the interactions of structural complexity and body size on predation risk, as well as foraging efficiency. I can talk to you, I tried to do growth, <laughs> and it was, 
a mess, and I'm happy to talk about that later, but we did foraging efficiency as a, a second um, effort. So let's start with structural complexity habitat selection. For this, I constructed this aquaria with both high and low density ASUs, they're called artificial seagrass units. So it's essentially just curling ribbon, ribbon but in habit, er, it mimics seagrass really well. Um, and a, a trial started where I put three fish of the same size class in this choice experiment, and then looked multiple times throughout a tr uh, throughout replicate to see um, where they were hanging out. I put three so there would never be a tie. So if in this example, high structural complexity would be the selected um, shoot density. And I did this for each, each size class. Um, and to orient you with this figure before I pop in data, because this will look similar through the rest of this, this presentation, um, we, I've grouped this total range of, of individuals into these three size classes. So we have small, medium, and large. Um, I'll have some metric on, on the y-axis, and then the bars will pop in with high or low shoot density or structural complexity based on those colors. So what did we find? For habitat choice, we did find that it depended on the body size. So almost always, we found that small kelp fish were hanging out in high structural complexity. Um, and large kelp fish often selected for low structural complexity. Um, I also supplemented this with a field experiment where essentially I ran transects in the seagrass bed. If I saw kelp fish, I'd, I'd size it and put a little flag in the seagrass and then I'd come back and measure a quarter meter square shoot density where that, yield, where that kelp fish was hanging out. And in fact, we see this negative relationship. So as shoot density increases, you often see smaller kelp fish. Pretty cool. Okay, but now we wanna know, like, is this optimality model what's predicting this, this choice or um, selection effect? So now we're gonna get to the predation risk. So, for predation risk, I did a field, manipulative field experiment where I tethered three size classes of kelpfish and two um, densities of seagrass. Um, I had IACOC approval <laughs> for this, if you're wondering. <laughs> and the reason I did is because the grad student before me was tethering California halibut babies, so it was like, oh, you could do kelpfish all day. <laughs> we don't care about them. Um, but, no. It, it was really it was really helpful and uh, honestly kelpfish are such a great study system for tethering because do you notice this is a tethered kelpfish right here you'll see like a little orange flagging tape and that's my rebar um, when they're in the seagrass beds they they have these striations that that happen like occur on their body which are supposed to be like emulating interstitial space of seagrass so when they're scared they kind of take on this just like vertical like I'm pretending to be seagrass kind of thing. So the tethering actually, like it didn't change their behavior a whole lot, like you would imagine some fish would not like to be tethered to a piece of rebar as a predator's swimming by. Um, so anyway, I, did, I deployed these tethering experiments. I used non-parametric survival analysis um, to look at, which compares the difference in time until an event occurs, an event being a predation event, um, and then you can compare among those treatments. So each trial was five hours long. This was a ton of work. I like scuba dived every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, hour for five hour trials. Um, so I was able to have this time series of data. Most tethering data is like you come back at 12 hours, you come back at 24 hours and you see how proportionally how many were eaten. Um, so because I had this time series, I was able to do the survival analysis technique. Um, we found that there was an effect of structural complexity. So overall, all fish, regardless of size, had higher mortality in low structural complexity or had higher survivorship when there was more structure. Um, and there also was an interaction. So I'm just gonna split those by size. And you can see, again, I wanna emphasize um, that no matter what size you are, you had higher mortality. You got eaten more when you were in low structural complexities. However, the magnitude of difference was a lot greater in those smaller fish. So this, to me, says that high structural complexity might be really critical for those little babies to get to those bigger sizes. Cool. Now we're going to do foraging efficiency. So really similar experimental design. I had three fish body size groups. 
I cross them in high and low structural complexities and put them in those big buckets, like the ones with the white rope handles. I forget how many gallons those are. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and then I stocked each one of those tanks with 30 hippolyte or little grass shrimps. And these are like snickers to the kelpfish. They love them. They just like gobble them up. So um, I did a bunch of trials crossing body size and structural complexity. I also did a trial with no structure. So for each size class, so I was able to have like a proportion of fish shrimp consumed um, at each size class. All right, and so let's put this data up. What we found is that for smaller size classes, although not a significant difference, we did see more times than not, small kelp fish were eating more um, shrimp in the high structural complexity. Again, there was no difference of the medium size class, but we saw this shift where lar larger kelp fish were eating more shrimp in lower structural complexity um, treatment. Okay, what does this all mean? So we put this together in this little schematic um, where we can see small kelp fish had lower predation risk in high complexity as well as big, big kelp fish across the board. High complexity was better for refuge. Um, for foraging, we found that kelp fish actually foraged better in high structural complexity, while larger kelp fish forage better in low complexity. So thinking about this optimality model and we're minimizing this mu over, I'm calling F, the ability to grow <laughs> via foraging, um, we can put these two things together and find that when you're small, a little baby kelp fish, high structural complexity is your jam, that's where you wanna be. When you get larger, there's a trade-off. So when you're in high complexity, you're, you're taking refuge, but you're less able to forage when you're in high complexity relative to low. And what this says to me is that this high level of heterogeneity or change in seagrass within one seagrass bed might also be really vital for larger kelp fish if they're utilizing like minute to minute variability in structural complexity. Um, and then I just put the ratios in a bar format um, to show you optimality for small is high structural complexity, medium, the ratio is a tiny bit smaller for high, and then we see this switch to low structural complexity for large kelp fish. And what's pretty cool round um, to go back to this, high, this habitat choice experiment is that we see what we predict in the optimality model is what we found in the structural habitat choice experiment. Okay, that is first story done. Um, now I'm gonna move on to what I've been working on, or what I was working on in my PhD, um, thinking about local and regional factors and how they influence the stability of a community. Okay, so as global change is increasing in intensity and frequency, identifying the drivers of stability is critical for improving both um, our ability to predict and manage the dynamics of natural ecosystems. And one common way to measure stability is to think about the temporal dynamics or the te temporal changes of a community's composition through time. So for instance, if, this, if we knew that this kelp forest, macroalgal dominated, beautiful kelp forest was stable and we looked at it through time, the time series might look something like this ordination plot. And I'm bringing up an ordination plot right in the beginning because you're gonna see a few of these through my talk, so I wanna make sure everybody's clear on what they are. Um, these NMDS plots, or non-metric multi-scaling dimension plots, essentially take all the species and they converge them into two axes. And the biggest thing, if you don't remember anything from it, the biggest thing to remember is that two points that lie closer to one another their communities are more similar than two points that were lying further from one another on the plot. So a stable community, if we look through time, there's not a lot of turnover in the community's composition. It's kind of just staying together, right, in one, one portion of the plot. Conversely, if we knew the system was really unstable and we saw through time it was changing back from kelp to urchin-dominated um, system, it may look something more like this NMDS plot where we see the community is urchin dominated, we see a big shift in community turnover and it's macroalgal dominated, and then back to urchin dominated. So um, the biggest take home in this is that there's just more spread or more community compositional turnover um, through, through time. 
but what makes a community stable? So stability can be impacted both through local or regional mechanisms. Um, specifically, local mechanisms like biodiversity um, can really impact stability, so having a really large trophic food web. Um, at regional scales, things like um, the level of dispersal from neighboring communities can really lead to variation in stability. Um, and thinking about a really well-known idea that kind of integrates both of these local and regional processes is the theory of island biogeography. Now, if you haven't heard about island bio biogeography in um, any of your ecology courses, I'm going to go through what this process is quickly. Because it's really popular because it's really well predictive in, in natural systems, but also it's a really simple design that's also well predictive, which I think is pretty cool. So island biogeography predicts species richness based on two landscape attributes, distance from mainland and island area. So when we consider distance, islands that lie further from the mainland versus closer to the mainland will experience um, reduced rates of species colonization. While as for area, larger islands will have lower species extinctions relative to smaller islands. And it's these two opposing forces that kind of work in a dynamic equilibrium, species colonizing and species going extinct that are able for us to predict this given species richness value. Although species richness isn't constant through time, right? So these islands might be experiencing turnover with one species going extinct, which would differ from a new species colonizing. And that can change the species identity present, and it can also change these species abundances that are present. And together, we can think of these two things as the community's composition. So diving deeper and considering how spatial processes affect not only species richness, but also the community composition through time or community stability may help us understand if we can use IBT also to predict things like stability. So this kind of gets at my overarching question. Um, is the temporal stability of pond communities? Oh yeah, sorry, I haven't told you about pond. That's what we're doing. Um, stability <laughs> of island communities, let's say, predicted by ecosystem area, or I'm calling it dispersal limitation, but you could think of it as distance from mainland. Oh, yeah. And if that is the case, the second question I want to ask or follow up is, is that actually a direct relationship or is it just mediated via island biogeography theory, right? Because there's a lot of work on this path. Do increases in species richness increase stability? And we know that this path is predicted. But I want to know if we do see this relationship with stability, is it actually an in, a, a mediated via species richness? So here come the ponds. So my system is uh, this array of coastal, I like to call them lagoons. They sound nicer than ponds. <laughs> um, the southern shore of Rhode Island. But although I'm saying ponds, they are marine. They're just like really enclosed bays is maybe how you, and they're pretty shallow. But they have, they have like, we call it um, a breachway. And it's like tidally influenced, like 80%, 80 to 90% of the, the fish and inverts are marine. Um, so the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management has these long-term monitoring stations indicated by these points on the map where they look at the fish and invertebrate communities monthly from May to October of every year. Um, the data set I will be looking at spans 2010 to 2015. Like I mentioned, a lot of these species are marine. We even get like, we'll get like grouper, like butterfly fish from the Gulf. And they die off by, by the winter, but they just, hit that Gulf Stream and all of a sudden they're in the ponds. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, like this is little Jack Cravale. Um, okay, sorry. And the, diff the ponds differ in their characteristics. So we have amounts of eelgrass, we have natural and restored oyster beds there, and salt marsh. So they're, it's a pretty cool model system to have these like six little ponds all right next to each other. Um, the other cool thing about them is that they differ in their area and their, I'm calling it distance to ocean breachway. So you see where I'm going. So thinking about islands, we can think about ponds or like marine islands maybe. Um, and a proxy could be pond area. So we have variability in the area of the pond. And we also can, we can, we can calculate dispersal limitation as, because again, these are marine, so larval inputs are coming into this breachway. And we can measure 
what I did is I measured from this breachway to each sampling station, like as a fish swims, imagining I was a fish. Um, and this is a little infographic I made just to show the variability of these two features, right? So you can imagine this is the ocean. These lines are standardized based on the distance from breachway. And these dots, the sizes are standardized to their size. So we can see there's variability across the two metrics. And importantly, they're not correlated. So some, some ponds are small and close. Some ponds are small and far. All right. So to get at this first question, I looked at the community. First, I just wanted to like see what the community data looked like through across space and time, right? And to look at that, I did a, a couple of different um, multivariate analyses, an NMDS and a PermaNova. And so this is what the, my um, NMDS plot looks like. I'm going to orient you to it before I start popping in other things. Um, again, this is like, I think it's like 25 species. is the, the max species of one of the samples. So it's 25 axes converged into two, right? So it is a transformation of data, don't get me wrong. But it converges in a way that you can get an idea of the relative community composition one year to the next or one pond to the next. So these numbers on the NMDS plot are the ponds. I'm sorry, the colors on the, on, the, on the NMDS plot are the ponds, and the numbers are the years. So this is like the community's composition in 2010 for Green Hill, GH. So we can see that there's, oh, also there's these little species scores, which are the, um, the actual fish species on overlaying. And you can, you can think like, OK, um, this summer flounder, maybe these ponds have a lot of summer flounder because of that species score. It's, it's closer to those communities. We can also overlay these like ordination ellipses. And you can think of these almost like standard error bars, but in, in ordination space. So when they're not overlapping, it means that potentially these communities are different. And so we ran a PermaNova to test that. And we found that there was a pond effect. So the communities were different across pond. They were different across year but they were not different with their interactions, just suggesting that the effect of year is like consistent across the ponds. OK, we have the community. Now we want to measure instability. And so I'm now talking about the inverse of stability, instability, which is turnover of a community through time. And so this is through three metrics, the convex hull area, which this is we just drew a polygon in ordination space that encompasses all years at the pond, and then take the area of it. So it's like a snapshot. We have year-to-year -year distance, which is the year in ordination space, the, the distance in ordination space from one year to the next, and then you take the average. And then year to centroid, which is the centroid you can think of as the mean community, and it's the distance from each year to that mean. And for all of these three metrics, a larger value indicates greater instability or more community compositional turnover from year to year. And I looked at this instability metric with um, the relationship of pond size and ocean distance via um, linear regression models. And basically, um, this is, I'm going to set this up where we have on the left side the instability metric. On, in the middle column, you have the relationship of instability and pond size and instability and ocean distance. When points are higher, it means there's greater instability or it's less stable. And when points are found lower on the y-axis, it means it's more stable. What we found is that as you increase pond size, you actually have less instability. Another way you can say it is larger ponds are more stable than smaller ponds. Um, additionally, we found a positive, um, a positive relationship with instability in ocean distance. And that would just say that smaller ponds that are closer to the ocean are more stable than ponds which are further from the ocean. And we found this was true for the other two metrics. So cool. We predicted community stability using island biogeography theory. Um, now I'm, I'm wondering, is this actually just, again, this byproduct of the relationship of species richness? So for this, I used a structural equation model or path analysis approach to look at how these two um, factors influence instability. So the direct relationship would be the path coefficients of these green, green arrows. And the indirect relationship, this is a little tricky. So I'm going to, for example, the indirect relationship of pond size on instability mediated via species richness is the product of these two paths. 
So you multiply this path coefficient by this path coefficient to get that indirect relationship. And the instability metric I'm using is year-to-year -year distance, but we found similar for Eurocentroid as well. So um, this will be the path analysis. I'll pop in the coefficients, but we'll see red arrows indicate a negative relationship. Black arrows indicate a positive relationship. Um, if the arrow is solid, it was a, pot, uh, a significant predictor or path in that model. If it was dashed, it was a non-significant um, path in the, the model. So for pond size, we found a negative effect of pond size and instability. If you go back to what I just talked about, that makes sense. As you increase pond size, instability decreases. Oh, I forgot to mention, these path coefficients, you can think of them as slopes, right? So it's like a negative slope, a negative effect. For the indirect interaction, this is cool. This is ion biogeography. We found it, confirmed. As we increase pond size, species richness increases. What we did not find is a relationship of species richness and instability. So we are unable to even actually calculate an indirect effect, making the direct effect the most important um, for, for pond size on instability. Again, the positive effect of ocean distance on instability and we found a negative effect of ocean distance on species richness. So as you get further from the ocean, species richness decreases. But it's the same path, so obviously um, there was no relationship of species richness on instability in our path. And that was true for both metrics. So for both pond size and ocean distance, we found that the direct paths were, were the actual mechanism behind, or not mechanism, but were driving instability, and it was not mediated by the level of species richness in the ponds. So this work just maybe suggests that the diversity stability debate might actually be like a byproduct, um, and its resolution isn't really sufficient or necessary to understand the stability of multi-trophic communities. Um, instead, well-established ecosystem properties that um, historically have been linked to species richness might actually um, be able to be used to predict stability of multi-trophic communities um, in a changing um, ecosystem, which is pretty cool. Okay, I'm at 32 minutes. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna switch gears. Last, the last portion of my talk is talking about what I'm doing at Santa Cruz. Um, and I, this is gonna be, again, our spatial scale is gonna get a lot bigger. We're thinking like all of California or even within regions, because um, we're gonna talk a little bit about species distribution models. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So. This project is a collaboration with folks at UCSC, so Drs. Pete Raymundi, Mark Carr, and at Oregon State, Will White. There's also a bunch of other collaborators that have come on board that I should have popped their little pictures up, but I didn't. Um, and so this is a huge collaboration. It's been so fun to work with, and we have funding through the Ocean Protection Council. Um, so, the, so we are coming up, or we are upon, a 10-year review of the California MPAs. Maybe everyone here knows this. <laughs> um, and you know, you've probably heard about all these decadal review. Pro, um, you know, there's like different habitats that we're all looking at and, and monitoring and, and trying to figure out like, are the MPAs working, right? This this is for the decadal review as well, but this is thinking more at a larger spatial scale. And are they working as a network? So when we look at, this is obviously not real, but um, this infographic of the MPAs along the California coastline, um, oh man, Monterey is like barely even there, isn't it? Um, when we, we, look at, we look at how this was designed, right? And the biggest feature I think that pops up in my head is that it's a network, right? So innately, it need, there has to be some sort of test of like, is this actually working as a network or are we, are we expected to manage each one of these MPAs separately, right? So because we have the California MPA network as a network, we need to understand, is it working as a network? So, and that is the MLPA goal, um, one of the goals of the MLPA, which is to ensure the state's MPAs are designed and managed to the extent as possible as a network. But understanding what connectivity means can be really broad and 
it can mean like gene flow, right? Or it could mean the flow of an adult from an MPA to a reference site. Um, but when we're thinking about, oh, I should mention for this project, we're, we're focusing right now on sh um, subtitle rocky reef kelp forest communities. And when we think about a lot of the dispersal, or I'm sorry, a lot of the connectivity of those communities, we're thinking about larval dispersal. Um, and I find this really exciting, as you all should know by now that I like spatial processes, <laughs> that we're integrating spatial management more into larger fisheries and resource management. Um, but to understand spatial management, we need to understand pop metapopulation dynamics. And to understand that, we need to quantify patterns of larval connectivity. However, we know that a lot of the fisheries that we're interested in protecting in these MPAs vary in the amount of larval time that they spend. So this is their pelagic, this is an infographic I made about pelagic larval duration. Um, and if you were interested in something like a red abalone, their spawning and their larvae are spending five to 20 days, 10 days on average in the water column before settling versus something like a blue rockfish can spend anywhere from 120 to 180 days. So you can imagine if you were a mama rockfish or, or a mama abalone, your babies are gonna go very different places depend, depending on what you are, right? Because of your PLD. So that is a big factor um, within this project is thinking about focal fisheries, what their pelagic larval durations are, and being able to actually um, quantify connectivity patterns via a number of um, tools. And these are the tools. So we are using a ROMS model or a region ocean modeling system. Essentially, this is just a ocean circulation model that can track particles in the water based on climate data. So um, you can imagine a particle would just be a larval, a baby fish or um, a baby abalone. And you can see, you can turn on this ROM model for 60 days and then stop it and see where those particles end up. Um, we're also, we also created these species distribution models of the focal fish species to get an idea of um, habitat suitability. Once those propagules come into the near shore, are they likely to settle there? Or, you know, if it's blue rockfish babies coming into like Long Beach, would they settle? Um, probably not. And then in addition, life history and demographic information are all integrated into this demographic population connectivity model, which um, lucky for you guys, I'm not talking. <laughs> I'm not gonna go over the math today on that, um, but I will, I should have results at WSN if people are going, and I'm so excited to share them. Um, but today we're mostly gonna focus on the species distribution models. So again, I mentioned that we're doing this in kelp forest ecosystems, and a reason we're doing this, to be completely honest, is like we know the most about the fish in kelp forests via survey data, via um, different primary literature, via stock assessments. Um, so with the helping hand of Pisco and Reef Check, we have a total of 222 survey sites across all of California. All the sites look something like this, where these, there's this collection of transects where they sample fish and vertebrates and algae. Um, they are sampled annually. Um, our sites, the collection that, that I have for this data is sampled anywhere from three to 22 years. Um, these species distribution models are not temporal, they're just spatial. So the way I did this is I thought about this almost as a carrying capacity. So I, I um, calculated the 75% quantile of each fish's biomass across all years. And what we, so how to make a species distribution model is we have to fit a model to this fish data, right? And we need predictors to fit to this data. And so we drew these polygons around the sites essentially to extract environmental data to relate to the survey data and create these SDMs or species distribution models. And the predictor variables were, um, we had some substrate variables via multi-beam bathymetry, so things like depth, um, the amount of rock at a site, the rigosity of that rock or the slope of that rock, and we calculated both average and, and variation across the polygon level. Oops. Um, we also have kelp metrics, so we have like a composite CDFW flyover data, which gives us the max um, cover that you could 
have of kelp in your site. And then Landsat data is giving us mean proportional biomass of kelp. And then um, we tested a bunch of different actual like environmental predictors and realized that for fish, probably temperature is the best predictor to use um, that wasn't correlated with other things. So we used um, average annual monthly min, max, and mean of sea surface temperature across. So all of, the, all of this data, these little tiny polygons were placed on top of that data, and then they were extracted the data at the polygon level. And so we have predictors that we can now test against the response variable, which is the fish data. And I took on this hurdle model approach, which kind of combines both a logistic regression or like a presence absence model and then a GAN to test the biomass density. The way I like to think of this model is like, you go to a site and you say, all right, what's the probability that you're gonna find a black rockfish there? And if the probability is after, uh, off of a certain threshold, you say, okay, it is there. And then if it's there, how much of it is there via the GAM? So the, the GAM is biomass density, while the logistic regression is like, is it there or not? And we're using this hurdle two-tiered model approach. Um, and so then I trained and tested all our models with doing full subsetting, so all the predictors in there, um, and doing different subsetting techniques, as well as cross-validation with both the train and test data set. Um, I will explain that more if that doesn't make sense in a second. I'm gonna show you the results just for blue rockfish, because I don't wanna go through. I've done this now for six fish species, plan to do it for a few inverts as well, um, but we're gonna start with blue rockfish. So for a logistic regression, what came out as most important was the average amount of rock, the variability in depth at the polygon level, and the min sea surface temperature, the average min sea surface temperature. And then for our GAMs, or general additive models, we found that kelp cover really mattered, the variability or standard deviation of the amount of rock, um, again, the average sea surface min temperature, and VRM is like rugosity, so the variation in rugosity of the rock. And so we took the best models, and we have this test data set, which is like, we just took 20% of our data and we didn't touch it, and we trained all our models on 80% of that data. Then we like, all right, we know these are our best models, we're gonna test it on this 20% and see how accurate we are. And that's what this is. So this is the predicted biomass density of blue rockfish. So this is what we predicted is on the X and what the actual biomass density of blue rockfish is on the, on the Y. So you can see sometimes we thought there was biomass when it should have been a zero. And it's, it's not perfect, but it's a decent fit. Um, I also plotted this on a map just to like visualize biomass density across the Pisco sites. So these are the actual Pisco sites and this is the predicted. So at least latitudinally, we're doing, we're doing pretty good in, in predicting ranges and, and um, overall density. I did this for six fish. I honestly, I couldn't fit them all, so I, I'm showing you three more, but I've also done this for gophers and kelp rockfish. Um, but we're doing pretty good. Like we found models, best models for all of the fish species, and we were able to predict correctly. The next step is now we have the best models and we want to predict out to the whole coastline. Like we want to know, not at a Pisco site, what would the biomass density of kelp bass be? So to do that, we now, I have all these predictors in these like raster data. So there's just these like these little pixels of data across the whole coast of California. And we can actually do this thing where we stack them. So you could look at one pixel, you could click on it, and it would tell you what the kelp cover was, what the depth was, what the proportion of rock, what the, all of our predictors are kind of like stacked in this, in this one raster stack of, of pixels. So then we know all the predictors, we know the models, we can use that to actually just predict out biomass density. So this is, you know, as you guys know, the Monterey Peninsula um, and fish biomass density of blue rockfish. Cool, so we were able to make full predictions out to all of California's coastlines. Um, this is what, this is another example, I'm kind of just doing the logistic and GAM together. So the logistic model, I've kind of decided to narrow in at, on point conception in the Northern Channel Islands, because this is a good transition zone for blue rockfish. 
where you typically don't see blue rockfish south of Point Conception, but you do see them on the um, Western Channel Islands because of this really, this is a big temperature gradient right here. Um, so for the logistic model, it did pretty good. This like light blue that you might not be able to see very well is predicting they are there, and the black is predicting they are not there. Um, and then we also did the, the GAM model, which predicts biomass density. Again, you kind of see it fall off to just gray, which is no biomass. We can essentially just take these two rasters and multiply them by each other, because one times biomass <coughs> density is going to be biomass density. But it will, if, there, if by any means the GAM is predicting biomass, that the logistic regression would be predicting a zero, it'll zero that out. I will say that. I think we could have just been fine with the GAMs. Like overall, the GAMs did just as good of a job, and I'm not sure that multiplying the logistic model really helped, but um, it, it didn't hurt. And so now we have, the next thing we have to do, we have species distribution models, biomass density calculated in all the California coastline, and we want to find how much biomass exists at these ROM cell levels. So when, when I did not do this, but when the ROM solutions are um, composited, they are put on the, you have these like big polygons, which are this like green yellow color, and that's where it's like taking in all the propagules. So we know at this spatial scale the number of propagules that are coming in, and we need to figure out how much total biomass is happening at each ROM cell. So to do that, right now this is in biomass density, so I calculated the total number of rock um, and use that as a metric to, to calculate all of biomass out. And then I summed all of biomass at the ROM cell level. So then we would now have like total biomass of these ROM cells. And so I have this for the whole coastline for all fish. Um, but the way I'm thinking about how this is actually working into the model is we're thinking of it as like this max carrying capacity or suitability for a site. So I think I said this in earlier in the talk, but if you had, say you had blue rockfish coming, or you had, we were modeling blue rockfish and you had propagules coming into Southern California, the SDM is almost this like filter that like, that works with the propagules. So you might still have a thousand propagules land somewhere in LA, but because the habitat model says that there's no blue rockfish, they're, they're just gone, right? So it's kind of like, modeling the idea of, of, of recruits dispersing into non-habitat and not making it. Um, and for technical reasons, that is, this is going into this like density-dependent Beverton-Holt model within the dem demographic population connectivity model. Um, and I am going to WSN, and I hope other people are. And I, like I mentioned before, I'm I have the model running, but I didn't have results good enough to like share with you guys today. I'm happy to talk about that um, if people want to talk, but um, I didn't want to share things too soon before I had it really <laughs> nailed down. <laughs> um, but thank you all for listening, and I would be happy to take questions if people have any. And I hope I didn't make your head spin with like, Question about um, the habitat uh, suitability from the, the second part of the of talk. Uh, yeah. I thought that was really cool how how you looked at species richness and how like is that really a good picture or is it just kind of happened to align with the with like habitat suitability, which is the more direct thing. And so I was wondering um, in this model, do not richness but do individual species count as like their own uh, factor that directly affects um, habitat suitability, like a, like a keystone species, for example. Yeah. Um, are you talking about stability? I just want to make sure. Yes, stability. Decided. Stability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay, because I was like. I, so I was making sure. Um, that is a great question, and it's a great segue to the rest of my chapters of my dissertation, <laughs> which are, I like, I joking, I joked that my, like, dissertation, the, like, the real name should be called species richness sucks <laughs> because I feel like I was just like hating on, even though I think that metric in, in some ways is really important. Um, but I, the next step I do is look at functional diversity and how um, functional, I essentially do a similar approach where I think about instead of, if we were to go out in the field and not look at a fish and say, that's a lingcod, 
but we were to say that's a tertiary predator or that that fish's gape size is this big if we if we like looked like we looked past identity and we thought about a community as a, a, a whole thing of functional traits how does that change stability um, and basically the take home is that I found that there's a chance that we are underestimating underestimating there, essentially within those Rhode Island coastal ponds there was a ton of functional redundancy so a lot of fish had really similar functions so when you think of it as a species richness level you're calling those things different or it's not a community composition level you're saying they're different species right but if they're functionally the same if they're doing the same thing we might be under or no, overesti underestimating stability or overestimating instability or turnover, if we think about it in a, in a trait lens. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank I you. don't know if that fully answered your question, but when you were saying keystone species, like I, I see what you're saying in that like, you know, we need to like look more into what a community is. Than, yeah, I was yeah. kind of wondering if sometimes the reason that richness gets used is, even though it doesn't seem to be directly, directly correlated with stability, is if sometimes it's kind of like firing like a, like a like a kind of like statistical shotgun and you're like look if we look at species richness eventually we'll find the one of the important species that does matter for stability yeah, yeah definitely or i think a lot about in terms of like restoration conservation monitoring we can't be out there measuring every single fish is <laughs> you know like sometimes we like with resources and money and trying to get like a greater idea about how our communities look Sometimes species richness is the best we can do, and I still think it's great. But my dissertation, and then like the third chapter is talking about like intraspecific variability in traits. So it's kind of like all about what is within within variation of diversity. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that segue. Cool. Diversity. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. That was yeah, fantastic. Of course. <laughs> And my second chapter is in review, so maybe I should like work that in. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, yeah, I was like, that might <laughs> not rock the boat. But yeah, thank you, Arthur. Cool. Well, yeah. I was thinking about the, the SDM models. Yeah. Which were really interesting. They really well. Yeah, yeah. Surprisingly. I don't know. I was pleasantly yeah. surprised. <laughs> I was thinking about, I mean, are those when you figure out kind of which predictors? Are important. Do they seem to be consistent if you consider different life stages? So I was trying to think like, you have to deal with juveniles showing more recruitment in those processes. Yep. Is yeah. Similar predictors to how many juveniles you would get as the so biomass is probably your community might be both life stages, right? They can be sorted. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Scott, that's such a good question, and it like lines up perfectly with my talk, too, because I was like, just the transition of thinking of ontogeny and, and, with the scale of data that I have, I didn't do any kind of sorting of sizes or anything, but I would, that, that seems like a whole nother avenue of research for, for doing SDM. So my answer is I don't have that. Yeah, we have size, yeah, yeah, we have size, and I've calculated, essentially I did all of this as I calculated out as just biomass first. So it's not even individuals, um, but it could easily be done, um, but I haven't done it. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah, thanks. Okay. About the um, adult fish. Oh, so, yeah. It's my which favorite. Is really cool. I mean, that's what you mentioned. So I'm trying to think what, what do you think of the factors that, that cause them to transition from the young grass beds? Oh, like, yeah. At some point, are they just are they getting too big? It's so or is it just the place that is provided by the place or the prey changes? Or, or what do you think? Ma, yeah, yeah. All of those are hypothetical or are great thoughts. I've so 
moving to San Diego, I came in like, you know, all excited to do research and realized that like, and the kelpfish were, you know, had been studied a little bit because they're a great model system in eelgrass beds. Um, but there was a lot of like talk on whether, everyone was like, somebody needs to tag these guys. Because like, Todd's, Todd Anderson's theory was like, they're not contributing at all to the kelp forest. Like, they're just getting, getting, getting munched in the bay and they're not, which fine. Like for my work, I don't, this is just a model system. Um, but we, we did find, I looked back at like old, I think like Larry Allen or somebody had done trawls in the bay many, many years ago, like out of seagrass beds and found adult kelpfish. And like, so I saw that there are adult kelpfish living in the bay um, that are, and they had them sized and they were much larger than the juveniles. Um, my thought would be, no San Diego, say, yeah, in San Diego Bay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they might have, I think they also, that project might have also done Mission Bay. Um, but thinking about prey in San Diego eelgrass beds, I don't, I mean, we think about their mouths, they're not that big, but they, it might be that like, because they typically eat those little, those little grass shrimp or they'll eat like mesograzers on the seagrass, like little amphipods and stuff. Um, so I, my thought would be, and with ecological theory, it would be maybe driven via prey, like that they need more food to sustain them and they're not getting, at least in the community that I'm familiar with in, in, in eelgrass beds in San Diego, there's not a ton of other, I guess there's little crabs they could eat, but. I don't know. They get big, like I think they get like this big. Yeah, I'm assuming. That could be the prey. Yeah, yeah. Like there's little blennies and stuff, but they're but kelpfish are quite dominant in, in San Diego eelgrass beds. Um, I'm sure there's other fish that I'm forgetting, but yeah, I bet it's prey um, would be my my guess. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I don't know if you mentioned this already, did, but did you uh, have an know or have an idea of why going off of your question of why the bigger fish use the Apache habitats more, or like what they use the different densities for? Yeah, my so that was a total guess. I don't have like I don't have like film or like film. <laughs> I don't have like a video of them like moving from patch to patch, but because of where I found them, well, I would often find the big ones in low density or they selected low density in the aquaria. Um, but because predation, maybe my hypothesis is that because foraging efficiency was so low in high densities, that my hypothesis was that they, maybe they're like foraging and hanging out in low densities. If a big sand bass comes in, they like jet into the higher patches, high density patches. Um, but that was totally just based on the experiments I ran and the thought of like predation risk was high in low, low seagrass, but foraging was high in, in low density for, for big guys. So they might be using um, the patches differently. I also did tethers on the edges of the seagrass beds um, and they were getting picked off like really easy across the board. Like it was, I barely even had like data to, to put on the treatment. So it was very clear that the edges were, were um, and when I say edge, I mean like the deep water edge, um, not on the shallow side, but on the, the deep side. Because um, I would often see like big halibut and stuff hanging out on that, on that edge. Um, so the bigger idea was to get more of a landscape scale of thinking about patchiness of the seagrass and how that interacts with structural complexity to influence the total I made this like individual based model where they kind of have these behaviors and, and went through that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, of course. Hi. Um, that was great. Thank I you. really enjoyed the seagrass um, experiments. Yeah. And I'm intrigued. I would like to ask kind of into that you were going to first look at growth rates. Yes. And oh then you had to switch to foraging efficiency. Yes. I had everything that could happen wrong. I had like cages out in the seagrass bed, they were half meter by half meter cages um, and my intentions was to put them over high and low seagrass and I had three kelp fish per treatment and I was like putting oh, what is that like dye that you can put they put them in salmon a lot they tag salmon I forget the name of elastomer I like tagged them with elastomers and I soaked them in alizarin red 
I just did too much things to them, and I think I, so the alizarin red, the idea for that would have been really cool, because it would, it would lay um, a fluorescent ring on their otolith, and it was gonna give me like a start marker, and then I was gonna put them in cages for a month, pull them, extract their otoliths, and see how much their growth was, um, and see if that varied by seagrass density. Um, but my cages got hit by a boat, um, like I went out once and they were just like destroyed. I bet that fisherman or whoever that was was not happy. <laughs> um, and then the other big thing I didn't think about, which like I, I should have thought about, but it did a lot of shading, the, the, like the mesh shaded and all, like the seagrass just started thinning. And I was like, well now my high density is a low density treatment, you know? So I was like, I should have, if I had more time, I would have maybe tried to do it again, like with the artificial seagrass units and stuff. But this was like a month before I was leaving my master's and I did that foraging experiment like a month before I, I finished. So it was, yeah. <laughs> but it, it still worked out okay. But it didn't get it. I, th I think a lot about the metabolic, you know, conversion of eating those hippolyte. what does that mean for growth? And does that change with size, you know? So there, we kind of missed that point, but yeah. Thanks for your questions. Thank you guys.